I like to think that everybody has a happy place. A place that they can retreat to when things get to be just a little bit too much. Somewhere warm, safe, and comforting. And for me, that place happens to be the bright, colorful world of Banjo-Kazooie. This game has and always will have a special place in my heart. This knucklehead bear and his wise cracking avian buddy have been with me through it all, the good and the bad. They've always been there for me when I need them. Whenever life's gotten tough, this weird, wacky, wonderful game has provided me that warm, safe, comforting feeling every single time. As well as an unparalleled 3D platforming experience at a time when the entire genre was still getting its footing, featuring an unforgettable cast of characters, fun mechanics, and level design that could be considered the peak of its era and still holds up to this day, arguably outclassing many if not most of the games being developed right now. But we'll get to that. For now, sit back, relax, maybe grab some snacks and indulge me as I rant a little bit about one of my favorite video games ever made. Now that's right folks, I'm about to get wildly biased as we take a look back at Banjo-Kazooie for the Nintendo 64. The year was 1998 and Rare were on a hot streak. After killing it with the DKC titles on the Super Nintendo and with the release of the N64 at the tail end of 96, Rare were ready and... Rarin... to dive headfirst into 3D. Rarin. Rare. With the N64, Rare finally had the platform on which to explore their SGI modeling tech to its fullest. Having been up to this point relegated to compressing their state-of-the-art 3D renders to accommodate the 16-bit processor of the Super Nintendo, resulting in graphics that were, well, great for their time, a far cry from what Rare were ultimately capable of without these hardware restrictions. And so, following the N64's drop in September of 96, Rare wasted no time in flexing their developmental muscles and released not one one, not two, not four, but three different titles for the console in 97. Blast Core, GoldenEye, and Diddy Kong Racing. Yeah, it was a good year to own an N64. And be a rare shareholder. So what was next for the studio? How the hell do you follow up GoldenEye and Diddy Kong Racing? Well, as I'm sure you'd probably guess, you do it with a 3D platformer about a funny old bear named after Kermit the Frog's favorite instrument. That's Business 101. Honestly, to me, the weirdest part about Banjo-Kazooie was the fact that it wasn't the first game Rare put out for the N64. The studio had developed a bit of a platformy reputation with their incredible work with the Donkey Kong IP, and after the Donkey Kong Country and Donkey Kong Land series, it was clear to everybody on Earth that these guys just got platforming, okay? So I don't think anyone really expected Rare's first few 3D releases to be a top-down action puzzler, a licensed first-person shooter, and a Mario Kart-style racer, respectively. But hey, it was the 90s, everybody was experimenting. But by the time 98 came around, Rare were ready to return to form with one of the most ridiculous 3D platformers ever made. Banjo-Kazooie's like... it's kinda like when, um... Uh, I, honestly, I don't know how to sum this game up. He plays a bear named Banjo with a bird named Kazooie shoved into his backpack. No context is ever given to this dynamic. This is just how they live their lives. Banjo's sister Tootie is captured by an evil witch named Gruntilda who's obsessed with being the fairest in the land. So her goal is to suck the youth out of Tootie in order to make herself young and beautiful, leaving Tootie old and gross. It's kind of like a mix of Snow White and Hocus Pocus. Banjo obviously takes issue with Grunty's plan, and so him and Kazooie set off to storm Grunty's lair and save the day. And just like that, we're in business. It's hard not to compare Banjo-Kazooie with Mario 64. 64 had just come out two years previously, after all, single-handedly managing to reshape the entire video game industry forever, no big deal, and everyone and their mother were trying to put their own spin on this new formula. So what did Rare do to separate Banjo-Kazooie from the pack? Well, in this one you collect puzzle pieces instead of stock. But in all seriousness, when I think of both games, I feel like Mario 64 is Nickelodeon and Banjo-Kazooie is Cartoon Network, you know what I mean? Banjo's just a little edgier, a lot funnier, and just a little bit sloppier. Mario 64 may be the higher quality product, but there's just a lot more personality and humor to Banjo-Kazooie. Banjo's a big lovable oaf, and Kazooie's this sarcastic, snarky little piece of shit. They're expressive, they have voices. Unlike Mario, who's just a blank vessel for the player to control, Banjo and Kazooie are characters. They're funny, they banter, they react to the events happening around them. Kazooie isn't just a couple of cool mechanics, 
mechanic, she steals the show. Her callous one-liners and blunt delivery will get a laugh out of anyone playing this game, guaranteed. And this was actually the first major element that made this game step out from Mario 64's shadow. Having a legitimately likable, charismatic duo of protagonists that the player grows more and more attached to as the game goes on. This was an added element to the typical 3D platformer that we would see replicated for years to come with the likes of Jack and Baxter or Ratchet and Clank. I mean, come on. Look at this and tell me Clank isn't just Metal Kazooie. Now when I say Banjo's a little sloppier than Mario 64, I'm talking about the controls. Rare may have been a little ahead of the curve, graphically speaking, but from the moment you take control of Banjo, it's clear that the studio didn't spend half as much time as Nintendo did in fine-tuning the intricacies of movement in a 3D space. And while Rare definitely took notes from 64's playbook, particularly in terms of camera execution and general control scheming, compared to Mario, Banjo manages to feel simultaneously Simultaneously clunkier and more slippery at the same time. Mario's responsiveness just isn't there. It's a lot harder getting Banjo where he needs to go, and this is only amplified by the fact that Banjo doesn't have nearly as many options in getting to places as Mario does. Banjo's not doing any side flips, wall kicks, or long jumps, you know what I mean? This leaves the player with a lot less freedom to express themselves, and can ultimately make exploration and traversal in general much less satisfying as Banjo, especially if you're used to flipping all over the goddamn place in 64. Also, why the fuck do I come to a dead stop after a roll? Like, every roll, I can't just keep running? I can't just roll into a run? You gotta show the fucking Banjo standing up animation every time? I can roll my ass across Hyrule Field before nightfall, but Banjo needs a second to collect himself? What the fuck? Alright, I might be getting a little too harsh on one of my favorite games of all time here. The controls are fine. I mean, honestly, compared to 3D platformers of the time that aren't Mario 64, Banjo handles like a goddamn dream, alright? He's just not as fluid, intuitive, or quick to react as Mario, which may or may not even be a fair comparison, but can lead to flubbed platforming in some tricky spots. Luckily, the game slightly compensates for this with Kazooie's hover ability, allowing for at least a little bit of wiggle room in the jumping department, not unlike Flood from Super Mario Sunshine. But all of this being said, while it might not be up to 64 standards, Banjo and Kazooie do have a pretty solid set of moves and abilities for the player to utilize. You just have to find them first. This is Bottles, and he's responsible for teaching you all of the moves and abilities you'll be using throughout the game, like the Talon Trot, the Beak Buster, or the Shock Jump Spring. This dude even teaches Kazooie how to fly. Much like the backpack situation, how a vision-impaired mole is able to teach a bird to fly remains... Canonically unexplained. I've heard the complaints that making these abilities and moves unlockable throughout the adventure, as opposed to having them available from the get-go, makes controlling Banjo at the beginning of the game feel limited and restraining, especially on repeat playthroughs. That the Mario 64 method of giving the player every move in Mario's arsenal from the start is much better. However, I gotta disagree with that, and not because I think that one way is better than the other, but because of exactly that. They're two completely different ways to design a game. I think the people voicing these complaints are comparing Banjo a little too closely to 64. They are different games, similar, very, but in many ways, different. To me, saying that playing as Banjo at the beginning of the game feels limited and restraining is like saying playing as Samus at the beginning of Super Metroid feels limited and restraining. Like, yeah, that's the point. These abilities taught to you by Bottles lend an almost Metroid-style progression element to the gameplay of Banjo-Kazooie that you won't find in Mario 64. Rare wants you to feel limited at the beginning. That's what makes finding a new move or ability all the more satisfying. It adds that sense of achievement and growth that the player can tangibly feel. It's as simple as I can do something now that I couldn't do before. What does this open up for me? I feel excited when I get a new ability. Unlocking Kazooie's galoshes, allowing me to trudge through Bubble Gloop Swamp, gives me the same thrill I get as Samus finding the gravity suit, allowing me to trudge through Norfair. And yes, yes, I realize I just compared Banjo-Kazooie to Super Metroid for the third time and I don't even give a shit. These abilities also make any necessary backtracking through Grunty's lair all the less tedious as you search for areas and secrets previously inaccessible. I don't know man, it's a simple yet divisive design choice, but I like it. And personally, I think it was a smart move on Rare's part, and I think it did more than many realize to differentiate Banjo from other 3D platformers of its time. 
Another tip Rare picked up from Nintendo was the implementation of a hub world. Grunty's Lair is basically just a bizarro Peach's castle, dark and dank as opposed to bright and colorful, packed with enemies as opposed to packed with toads. Bowser may have taken over Peach's castle, but Grunty lives here, yo. And while both hubs do an amazing job of ferrying the players through the different levels they'll be combing through, if you were going to ask me my honest opinion, I think Grunty's Lair is better than Peach's castle. Now wait, wait. Let me explain. In many ways, Grunty's Lair manages to feel more like an overarching level, like it's a dungeon the player's conquering as they progress. At least, more so than Peach's Castle, which to me feels more like a museum with a bunch of paintings you just happen to be able to jump into. Like, goddamn, even the music is bright and cheerful. Where's the tension? Where's the drive? Honestly, if the game didn't keep telling me that Bowser kidnapped Peach, I would probably forget he was even here. In Banjo, the atmosphere is thick with Gruntilda, constantly reminding the player that they are in enemy territory. Monsters you encounter throughout each level will spill out into the hub world, literally chasing you beyond the confines of their respective worlds. Grunty will constantly throw taunts and insults at you as you advance through her lair. You'll find these little switches with Grunty's face on them hidden within each level, and hitting them unlocks a jiggy somewhere back outside in the hub world. It's simple, but these little touches go a long way in creating both a sense of immersion for the player and cohesion between Grunty's lair and the multiple worlds that exist within. In it, both of which Peach's castle simply lacks. Grunty's lair in general just has more enemies, more hazards, more puzzles, more secrets, more everything. Everything about it is just more. Minus the fact that you can't find Yoshi on the roof. And while both hubs feature the core theme of progression gating based on the total amount of key collectibles you've found, Grunty's even manages to take this a step further. A lot of the levels you're required to visit have some kind of puzzle or challenge to complete in order to gain access to their entrances. Or access to a level may require a specific bottle's ability that you need to unlock in another level. And you know what? While we're talking about levels, let's fucking talk about levels. It's clear to see that Rare put a huge emphasis on visuals and level design during this game development. Every level is a banger. Click Clock Wood, Treasure Trove, Cove, Gobies, Desert, they are all so vibrant and colorful, so distinctive, so fun to explore. And most importantly, they're all the perfect size, not too big, not too small, they're large enough to hold a satisfying amount of fun things to do and collect, but not so large that the player ever feels lost or like they're wasting their time just walking from place to place. You'll never get too far in a banjo level without stumbling onto something. There are eggs to collect, feathers, jinjos, mumbo tokens, but the main two collectibles in Banjo are the music notes and the jiggies. Music notes will open the numbered note doors barring your progress through Grunty's lair, and the jiggies will unlock each world and the final boss. And as important as the music notes are, the jiggies really are the power stars of this game. If Banjo ever fought King bob -Om, a jiggy would pop out, you know what I'm saying? But you won't be fighting King bob -Om. You'll never even know what you're gonna have to do to get a jiggy. Banjo Kazooie is obtuse. It is unpredictable. Unlike Mario, who gives each star's challenge a name, giving new players at least a hint as to what they'll be doing in even the most obscure puzzles, Banjo gives you no such hints. You jump into each level and you get to fucking work. It is up to you to find each jiggy. It is up to you to figure out that you need to transform into a crocodile, to crawl up the nose of this bigger crocodile, to challenge the red crocodile who lives inside to a mini game where you eat worms, okay? This game is unhinged. There will never be a moment where you say, oh yeah, that makes sense. Sometimes you'll be finding a walrus's pirate treasure. Sometimes you'll be playing a ghost hand's giant piano. Sometimes you'll be doing this, but the entire time you will be having fun. Banjo-Kazooie's core thesis is having fun, and it doesn't care what it has to do to get you there. You could be in the worst, most piss-awful mood of your entire life, and Banjo-Kazooie will force you, it will bully you, it will drag your mopey, sorry ass kicking and screaming over to the sunny side of the street and slap a smile on your face whether you like it or not. The reason Banjo-Kazooie is my happy place game is because it reminds me not to take things too seriously, that just because life can be chaotic doesn't mean that chaos can't be fun, that no matter what's going on in this moment, in the grand scheme of things, it's just a small piece of the bigger picture. It reminds me that, hey, if a dumb little bear and his bird buddy can defeat an evil witch, maybe I can secure that auto loan with the lowered APR. I give Banjo-Kazooie this holographic peace sign sticker out of five. That's a good one.